Nehemiah chapter 1. Hope you got a Bible. You already made your way there. That's where we're going to be uh, tonight. And let's just begin and ask God's help. Let's ask that he meet us and that, again, just that God's favor would be upon us and that he would draw each of us to that which he has in store for us. Father, we think about this moment and believe that you have preceded us here. Believe in your faithfulness that you're at work. Lord, I love the intricacy of that in lives different ways, preparing us for moments to hear your voice. God, I pray right now that we would. I pray you'd open up your words so that that which is laid there before us, we would see and understand. But at the same moment, you would just work fresh, that you would give us just ears to hear what your spirit would say to us right now, that though we're together, God, would you speak to us individually? By the power of your spirit taking this moment in our lives and drawing us to that which you have for us. We've got to look to you. We look to you and you alone able to do that. And so right now, Lord, in your favor, meet us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christian, I just want to remind you at the very outset this evening that God has made you his personal project and God has a plan for your life. God has made you his personal project, and he has a plan for your life. Now, we find that all over Scripture, but my favorite verse that speaks about this is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it simply says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hey, let's just wrap our mind around that just for a beginning as we start here this evening. We are his workmanship. Now, I know this. I'm speaking to a bunch of people. You are students of the scripture. These are not brand new things to you. And so even when I say this, your mind might already be going. But it's a fascinating word. Poema in the Greek, uh, some people would say it translates to the idea of masterpiece or poem. But it has the idea of an intensive work. That God would look at our lives and take us on as that personal project at work in us. Maybe the easiest way to imagine it is comparing it to something that would be like a side project. Uh, you probably have them, right? I mean, if I were to go and visit your home to this weekend and uh, go in there and, and look in your closets or look in your, in your garages, I would probably find some projects that you started like a year ago. And it's still there. And you're like, okay, I'm going to get back to that one of these days. You know, one of these days, you know, I'm just, I got, when I get time, that's a side project. That's not this word. This word has the idea of that which is intensive. In fact, maybe it's even just more simple for us to say, take that word workmanship and shrink it to work. This is what God has taken on as his work. This is what he is doing. Uh, again, not in any way to make light of it or little of it. It's as if it's his job. It's as if what he is doing intensively, passionately, purposely, that he's working on you and I, that he says, I, you are my workmanship. And in that, if you're a follower of Jesus here this night, he has created you for good works. That's worth us just thinking about just for a moment, that he has done that, that we are made to do those things which are good. And when the Bible would talk about good, it would think about things that are eternal, Things that are going to affect forever in people's lives. It would be things that matter, that your life is meant to do that. You're made for that. There's not anybody here this evening that God looked at you and said, hey, I just want you on the sidelines. That's all I really want. Like, all I want is you to, to watch everything else happening. That's not his intention. His intention is for us is to do that. Now, we want to talk a little bit more about that, but I need to pause right there and just make sure I say something very, very clear. Christian, you are saved for good works. You are not saved by good works. You are saved for good works. You're not saved by good works. We could back that up just for a little bit. We're there in Ephesians 2.10, but Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says it this way. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's a mountain of theology that comes in that understanding where he says, hey, you're not saved of good works, you're saved for good works. You're not saved of good works, you're saved for good works. Now, you might be thinking like, hey, Jim, this is a servant leadership conference. Like, hey, we are all those people, but here's what I recognize. For most of you, that's probably true. But you might be here this evening and quite honestly, 
you're still on the outside looking in. The dangerous thing about serving is that sometimes people can serve even in a church and you're not yet really even yet a follower of Jesus. In fact, you are in a space where you are doing what you do in effort to earn your way to heaven. I mean, somewhere in the back of your mind, it's like, hey, I serve in the kids' ministry. Like, surely that's like a shortcut, you know, uh, into heaven. I mean, if I do this, it's going to be there. I'm going to tell you, no. If you're here this evening, and even in this, the, the midst of it, you're one of those people that are thinking that you're still, your good works are going to outweigh your bad. Like, hey, if you work hard enough, hey, you're, you're there. If that's the basis of what you're doing here this evening, that's the basis of your service, hey, we want to plead with you to be saved. I'm going to tell you that God tells us that that's a a gift that he would give us. It's a work of his grace in your life and that he would transform you. And tonight, I want to make sure that before we talk about the good works that God has for you and I, that that would not be missed. And if that's you this evening, we're praying, I'm praying right now that God would save you, that he would draw you to your great need of him, that you would recognize it would never be anything that you could earn that would bring you into that. Good works, they're not earning God's favor. They're enjoying it. They're getting to see what God's doing in us because we're saved, because of his good work. And if that's you this evening, again, I just plead with you even today, hey, surrender your life to Jesus. Receive the good gift of his grace and be saved. Leaving you in God's hands, I want to come back to, again, this Ephesians 2.10 that tells us you're God's personal project. He has taken you on. You're, You're his workmanship, and he's made you for something. He's made you for good works. He has made you to do those things. And he says on top of that, that he's gone ahead of you. He's gone ahead of you. He's prepared them beforehand so that before you could even get there, they're already prepared. So all you need to do is walk in them. I don't know about you. I find that incredibly fascinating. In fact, it is that premise that I want you to join me now in Nehemiah chapter 1 because we want to think that through. Like, how do we do that? How do I find what it is God made me to do? Like, how do I do that? How does that work out in my life where that could happen? And that's exactly what we find happen in the book of Nehemiah. So you're open there to Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's take a quick preview at the good work that Nehemiah is going to do. It's going to change everything. It kind of is previewed for us there in verse 3 of chapter 1 when Nehemiah asks how things are going in Jerusalem. He says that, you know, he said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity are in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. We think about that, which is being laid out to us. And I, again, just recognize, hey, you guys are Bible students. So I'm just getting to remind you of what you already know. Hey, quick reminder. What, what, what had headed into this moment? What's brought them to this space? Well, Israel had been sent into what we know as the Babylonian captivity. Because of the sin of Israel, because of their rebellion, God had sent them into kind of a spiritual timeout. He had put them into Babylon for 70 years. In, into Babylon up in modern-day Iraq. There they had remained. Uh, in this time of judgment from God, and then he had begun to bring them back. They began just Zerubbabel coming, and and at the end of that 70-year captivity, bringing Israel back into the land. It would be 20 years later before they finally got around to and overcame their, their fears to rebuild the temple. Great things have been happening. But one thing that has not happened is the city's not restored. Where you and I are here in Nehemiah chapter 1, it has been a hundred and 40 years since the walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed. Nehemiah steps into this moment, and he's trying to hear how things are going in Jerusalem, and they tell him, hey, it's bad. It, it's bad. The survivors who are there, they said, you know, who, came, who have left that captivity, who have gone back from, from the Babylonian captivity mentioned in verse 3, he says they're in distress. They're in reproach. It's in a bad space. They're not in a good space at all. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. It's probably hard for us even to imagine, but in that culture, having the idea of a city without walls um, spoke of just no protection. It spoke of a space where your city was vulnerable to enemy, that it had constant fear, constant uh, just reproach, constant problems that were just constantly there. And once more, I just want you to look at this. That's where they are. 
But it's not something that's been happening, you know, just recently. It's been this way for 140 years the walls have been down. And yet Nehemiah is going to change it. Uh, the book that we're studying, we're going to watch it happen. We're going to watch him being called by God to step into this moment and see the city restored. The walls are going to be restored. The city's going to be restored. He's going to, again, do something that nobody else has done for all of that space. And again, I, I just don't think I'm able to impress with you how incredible that is. I don't know what God has for you. I don't know what things he's laying on in your heart. Maybe it'd be things that people have been doing all along. And that's amazing. Hey, that's incredible. But could you imagine being led by God to do something that hadn't been done for 140 years? And how good you are at math? That's like 1883. That's like, okay, it'd be someone saying, hey, that hasn't happened in America since 1883. Like, how would that ever, you know, kind of be in, in the midst of our world? But that's what he's going to step into. He's going to step into this moment that he's going to do a good work that's going to change things. It's going to restore the city. It's going to put a mark in prophetic history uh, that Daniel's going to you know, kind of you know, re reach his prophecy from this moment. I mean, it's an incredible moment in history. But let's just kind of explore for a few moments here this evening. Wow, like how did that happen? How did he get there? How did Nehemiah figure out that which God had for him? How did that whole thing came out? Well, we're going to look at a few things here in chapter 1. And I want to give you really like three main points that we'll kind of think through in that way, that we'll look through in Nehemiah, and we'll talk about in your life. The first one really is the providence of God. Hey, notice with me as it begins. Go back to verse 1. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the citadel. Then Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. We quickly gaze into this, and there's just a bunch of unanswered questions, but let me just toss them out to you. Like, how in the world did Nehemiah get here? I mean, he's in Persia. Why is he still in Persia? You know, was it his choice? I mean, the Jews had been sent to go back to Jerusalem. They had been released. Cyrus had come in there, had given them the, the, the privilege to go back, and somehow Nehemiah's not back. It was probably his parents, probably his grandparents' decision that kept him there in Persia, but he's there. He's there in the most powerful space in the world at this point in time, but on top of that. He's in the court of the king. Yeah, you can go to the end of the chapter just for a moment, reminding you what many of you know. He'll just end this chapter saying, for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah is one who's serving in the presence of the king. He is his cupbearer. That's one who would you know, check the king's uh, cup for poison. It is a privileged position. It is an honored position. It is a trusted position. And again, I just am finding myself asking 100 questions. Like, how did that happen? You know, how did he get to this space? And, you know, lots of ideas could come into the midst of it. But we just don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But I would hold out to you that that's the providence of God. Providence of God. Providence can be defined, one person's my favorite definition for providence is for God when he is working supernaturally, naturally. When God works supernaturally in a natural way, that he orders things to get us where we're supposed to be, which I want to remind to you, that's his promise, right? We just read it. Ephesians 2.10 says, you're his workmanship and he's made you for good works and he has gone ahead of you to prepare them. That's the idea, that he's going to orchestrate them, and he's going to orchestrate you where those come together. That's providence. I mean, it happens sometimes with, with it, no idea of it even happening. I think of this, the generation before this. Many of you guys know the story of Esther, and she finds herself in a similar situation, finds herself in the presence of a king, finding herself queen. And, and at one moment when Israel's hanging in the balance, when a, a, another, you know, kind of holocaust that is almost ready to break out and destroy the Jews, her uncle speaks to her and gives her that familiar verse that most of you know when he just tells her, hey, if you don't do this, God will raise up somebody else. But then he just reasons with her in Esther 4, verse 14, and he says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a 
time as this. Hey, do you, do you, can you even imagine for a moment that God has ordered your life to be where you are at the time that you are, that you were born where you were born, that you live where you live, that you just so happen to be in the right space where this is going to happen. That's providence. And I just want to hold out to you, that is God's faithfulness in your life. You don't have to do this. This isn't something that it, you have to manufacture. I just want to tell you, God will do it. And his faithfulness, he will bring you into spaces that he's made for you. He will bring opportunities to you that you're made for. They're, they're, that's, his, that's his providence that does that. And that's incredibly at work in this moment. And it's just worth noting that you just have to believe that. I mean, there's just something about believing. Like, God, if you have something, bring it. Like, show me. Like, show me what it is. Bring it into my life. Lead me in what that looks like. I'm in. You know, I mean, and yet just trusting that he will actually do that because he's that faithful. He does that. So providence is the first thing that gets Nehemiah in a position where he's going to be the one to do this good work and change everything for Jerusalem. The second thing I want you just to understand is it really is passion. Nehemiah's passion. So you watch this whole thing, and again, just going back to verse 3, they tell him, hey, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province, they are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was. When I heard these words, that I sat down, and I wept. And I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Amazing things are happening at this moment, and they're happening inside of Nehemiah. They're happening inside of his heart. God is directing him, and I want to just put before you this evening, we'll spend most of our time here, I want to tell you that he is directing Nehemiah's life through the burden that he has, through the passion that he has, the, through the concern that he has. He is he's provoking that inside of Nehemiah in a way that that's going to lead him to say, God, I'm in, like, and, and, and step towards doing what nobody has done for 140 years. So let's just think about this just for a moment. You, you might already believe me, and so I might have no need to spend time on this, but I want to spend a little bit of time. I'm going to give you just three verses, three other verses in Scripture that kind of say this same thing. And then we'll use them to kind of look at this moment. My favorite is found in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, when Paul says it this way. He says, For it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Hey, this is an amazing verse. Hey, just to make sure that you don't think I'm taking it out of context, it's the middle of a sentence. And so right before this, yes, he has just said, hey, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have a part to play in this. You can't just sit there and like let go and let God and sit on the couch and just assume it's going to happen. No, there's a place that he calls us to engage. That's another study. But God tells us what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to be at work inside of you. And that's what we already talked about, right? We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work. And God says, I am going to be at work inside of you, giving you the desire. I'm going to be at work inside of you, kind of creating the space for, so that you want this, so that you'll do this, that you'll want to do that, and I'll give you the power to do that. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, but I want to just quickly read the New Living Translation of that verse, because I like the way it says it. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I like that. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's working in you to, to work that place where what he has for you engages your heart, your mind, your soul, giving you a desire. And it's one of those things that will lead us to those things that God has for us. It would draw us there. Holding that verse aside, let, let me flip over to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Chapters 12, 1 and 2 begins this way. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
Wow, okay, big, just the big theological quick moment. Hey, this is a transition in Romans. Everything else led up to this moment, which is our great salvation. In essence, what you read a moment ago with me in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not you. It's not you. It's, it's a gift. It's a gift of God. Paul argues in the most magnanimous way in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And then he says, now, because God is so merciful to you, give your life to him. Give your life to him. Surrender. Like, say, God, here I am. I'll give you a living sacrifice. Like, it makes sense that I would say, because you've been so good to me, now I get to respond to that. Not earning favor, but enjoying favor. And then he tells us this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So he's saying the same thing. He says, here's the thing. Don't, don't be conformed. And it's a fascinating word. Conform means pressed from the outside. It's literally a word that would be seeking to stamp you or control you or squeeze you from the outside. He says, that's not how I'm going to lead you. This is not how I want to do this. He says, I want you to be transformed. I want you to be transformed on the inside out. I'm going to, I'm going to change the way you, you process this. The New Living Translation says that, you know, that God wants to change, the, you know, our lives be changed by changing the way we think. That that would be a process where he would lead us in that. And it would bring us into a space, he says, if that would happen, if you would be transformed, you'll be in the middle of God's will. You'll be in the middle of his will. It will be good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, again, the key that he gives us there is that God would begin moving our hearts by those desires. Hey, one more verse that kind of says the same thing. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. It's a great verse. It's a great verse. By the way, just make sure you understand it. Every now and then people read it wrong. They kind of think, hey, if you delight yourself in the Lord, like he'll give you something. Like, you know, it's as if somehow, you know, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll, he'll, he'll give you what you are desiring. As if somehow you could pull one over on God. Nothing like that. He says, if you love God, like you would really delight yourself in him. He'll begin changing your desires. He'll begin changing your desires and he'll give you the desires that would lead you into that. That's exactly what's happening to Nehemiah here. He's in this space where his heart is gripped by, by what's happening in Jerusalem, it tells us he was broken, he mourned, he felt it, and God began moving him to step into this moment by giving him those desires. So, I, again, I want to just hold to you that I believe it's not the only way. It's not the only way that God directs our life. Let's not make sure that I make it like, hey, this is the one thing. There's a lot of things he does. But one of the things he would do inside of you to direct your life to that which he has for you, for the good works he's prepared for you, is by giving you those desires. Now, heading back over here to Nehemiah chapter 1, as we think that through for a moment, um, I just want to process a couple thoughts around that. I don't know how you process this, but I, I find myself amazed with this, and sometimes even just amazed how God did this. And I want to just remind you of one of those things that you probably understand, but maybe I just need to say it. Pleasure, passion, it was God's idea. I mean, the whole reason that we can ever enjoy anything is because he gave us the ability to do that. Sin and Satan has never created anything. It's only taken the good gifts of God and, and, and twisted them to things that God didn't have. But God created it. I, I mean, I think about pleasure for a moment. I mean, I think about things like taste buds. I like taste buds. I mean, I, I like taste buds. I, I, I enjoy, you know, some good green chili. Man, I enjoy coffee. I enjoy, you know, just tasting. And I love just, in, in one sense, the pleasure that God has created for us to have in that. But let's just think this through for a moment. He didn't have to do that. He could have made everything bland. He could have made everything bland, and if he had created the world that way, you would never have known differently. You would have just been like, hey, I eat supplement 213. It's kind of what I need. It doesn't taste good, but that's what I, you know, how I process it. But he gave you the ability to taste. He gave you the ability to hear for, for, for music and for sound. He gave us the ability to see. He gave us the ability to feel. And behind all of these are places where we feel pleasure. 
where we feel passion, where we think, hey, this is a, this is a blast. This is, this is good. And one of the things I want to convince you of is that's what God wants for your life. We think about this conference. We're calling it to this idea of thriving. You know, that's, that Jesus said, hey, sin has come to, to you know, rob, kill, and destroy. I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Like it is life to the max, life to the full, life to the overflowing. And maybe you fully believe that, but I know we have an enemy that is working hard to convince you otherwise. And for some of us, somehow in our mind, even though we should know better, we find ourselves thinking, if I surrender to God, if I surrender to what he has for my life, it's going to be black and white, boring and miserable, and, and he's going to you know, make my life some kind of you know, just monotonous drudgery. Like, you know, somehow like we'd think, hey, that God would be saying, hey, that's what I want for your life. And some of us, that's how we see God's will, as if that would be what he is. And it's not that. God is saying, I want, I want, to, I want to give you a passion. I can give you a passion. And, and so that when you would step toward this, you would find God's good pleasure. And I just want to argue against Satan's lie. It's been the lie since the beginning of creation. It's the lie began in the Garden of Eden. And it still presses into your life. Satan's lie is that somehow God is robbing you. That somehow, if you do what God has for your life, it will be less than pleasurable. It will be less than the best. It would be less than all that would be there. It was the lie he gave, but it was a lie. It was a lie. Again, Jesus, in that passage in John 10, uh, verse 10, you know, he says, the thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and destroy. And that's what sin does. That's what Satan does. It messes us up. It robs us. But Jesus says, I have something better. I have, I have pleasure for you. I have, desire. I have this place where if you would walk with me, it would be that. And it would be that that would draw us to all that that would be. So instead of it being something empty, it would be full. See, we read it just a moment ago, but I, I think about that passage in Romans 12. And I want to just go back to it for a moment. Where he's telling us, hey, don't be conformed. Don't be pressed into somebody else's mold, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, then you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's good, it's acceptable. That's a good word, but maybe a better word, a better translation of that word is it is well-pleasing. It is well-pleasing and it's perfect. God's will for your life is good, well-pleasing, it's perfect. There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. And not only is it the right thing, it's the most satisfying of things. When Jesus was approached by his disciples outside of uh, you know, the city of, Jer of, of, of uh, there in Samaria, and he's got, you know, gone there to the woman at the well, and he's just done this incredible work, and they've come back, and they're trying to understand everything that he did. He simply said to him this. He said in John 4, verse 34, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. And that's a fascinating phrase. My food, that which is satisfying, that which is empowering, that which is pleasurable. Because, again, food is pleasurable. I mean, I, I don't know if you enjoyed it tonight. I don't know if you enjoyed the hot dog. I mean, it's good, good, good chili, good bite there, man. It's good stuff there. And in, in the midst of that, hey, it's good to be able to enjoy it. And Jesus says, hey, for me to do God's will, that's my food. That's my food. That's what satisfies me. That's what just draws me. That's my life. And so he draws us to see, hey, that's what God has for us. So I just want to talk to you for just a moment and just say, maybe you're fully there. Maybe I'm telling you stuff, and you're like, Jim, I get this. But I just want to tell you are, you, are you wanting to know what God has for your life? Well, part of it is to begin to say, just to figure out how he's wired you. Figure out what, what, what you have a heart for. What do you have a passion for? What, what grips you where you can't let go of it? What things take hold of your heart and, and, and find yourself moving towards something that would draw that? Because God says, I'm at work inside of you to give you those desires. So I think about all of that, and I want to take just a couple of moments to tell you a little bit of my story, just a little bit in the time that we have, um, because this played a big part of my story, and it still does. And it might just help sometimes to see it in somebody else's life, though your story might be different. 
See, I, I think about this. I didn't grow up as a Christian. I didn't grow up around Christianity at all. I was a full-on evolutionist um, in not just believing that that's what our world was, but it full, moved on to full-on existentialism, which is really a logical conclusion to that, which says everything's an accident. Like nothing means anything. There's no purpose. There's no value. Everything just happened. There is nothing to that. And, and that process guided my life, but it was incredibly empty. And without, you know, I can't tell you for sure what would have happened, but I just want to tell you as that process continued kind of forming itself in my life in my teenage years, it probably would have led me to suicide because I was like, what's the point? Like, you work, you, you know, you work to get money to go home. I mean, and you're doing nothing. Nothing means anything. Like there's no value to anything. And so when God was drawing me to Christ, one of the things he did in me was provoke this idea that he is God, that there is a plan. There's a beginning and end. And he was inviting me to be a part of that, that my life had value, that there would be a space of, of what that would be in my life. And that intrigued me. That drew me. He, he then drew me to the rest. I mean, drew me to the need of my sin, drew me to the, 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 the weight of that, drew me to the cross, drew me to believe in Christ. But I'm just telling you from the very beginning, I, I, I longed for this. It's like I wanted to say, is my life mean anything? Is there anything that would be valuable? And so God began to do that. Now, I would love to tell you that I was a very quick study and, and figured that out quickly, but that's not the case. I'm a hard case. I mean, I just, it took years. It took years of God kind of beginning to draw me. He did a lot of things. This wasn't the only thing he did. But one of the things he did is he did it through showing me passion. And he did it through showing me desire. Now, i got to be honest. Um, I can understand it now. I didn't understand it then. It was probably about six months. It might have been a year. Um, God brought me into contact with people who had passions to serve him, who had different passions than what mine now is. I didn't know that at the time. I, I didn't know that. Some of them were friends. Uh, sometimes it was a book I was reading. Sometimes it was a sermon I listened to. And one of the things that would happen is when I heard somebody else's passion, it was kind of like, I don't know how to say it better, like secondhand passion. I know that, that's probably a terrible illustration, like secondhand smoke kind of deal. I don't know. But it is one of those things. It was their passion, but I, I was being affected by it. And, and, and sometimes when they were passionate, I, I could feel it. And I could feel their passion. And I began to think, well, you know, I began to like, is, is that what you're saying to me, God? Is that what you have for my life? I'd meet somebody who was a missionary, and they would have a passion for missions. And like, man, Jim, it's, it's missions. we got to take the gospel to the end of the world. I mean, there's people dying who have never once heard the name of Jesus. Like, everything else is a waste. Like, we ought to be doing missions. And I can remember, like, hearing that and feeling that passion and being like, well, that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm a missionary. Like, like that's what I'm supposed to do. But then I would be disconnected from that person, either from time or it was a message or a book I led, read. And, and as soon as I began to get distance, it was kind of like my heart just began to cool. It's kind of like one of those places like you take a coal out of a fireplace or something. And you just watch it slowly cool. It's like, what's happened to my heart? And it's like you kind of poke it. And I mean, the, the, the knowledge was there. It's like, yeah, people are dying. They don't know Jesus. But I didn't feel the passion. And I'd be a little bit just moved by that. And then I'd meet somebody else. And they're like, no, Jim, it's children's ministry. Hey, you know, most people that get saved, they get, get saved in children's ministry. I mean, the gospel is the most powerful emphasis in the world in reaching kids. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's, and, I, and I'd feel their passion. And I'd be like, okay, well, that's maybe what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I'm supposed to be in kids' ministry. And the same thing would happen. They would be disconnected a little bit from my life, and the, the passion would, fully, would just ebb down in my life. I'd meet somebody else, and it's like, no, it's, it's college campuses. The battle for the souls of mankind is on college campuses. we got to be preaching the gospel there. And it's like, man, that's it. i got to do that. You know? and so, I mean, I would go from thing to thing. I mean, I literally went through probably a dozen things, and I would be so moved by somebody else's passion. And I would begin to think, well, that's maybe my passion, until they weren't there. And then, my, then it, would just, it would just die. Now, I can look back with a little bit of humor now and think, God, this is really fun. You're doing this. It was terrible when it was happening. Because I honestly was beginning to think, I think I'm broken. I, I think I'm broken. I mean, I, maybe, I don't, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I don't even have a heart because, I mean, these people have such hearts for God. And, and, and when they're not there, my heart is not, is not there. And, I'm, and, I, and I really, I, I was scared. I was like, man, something's wrong. Like something's wrong with me. Like my passion, it, it, it doesn't stay. Uh, when they're not there, when they're not stoking the passion in my life, it's not, it's not a genuine thing. 
And then God began showing me that I had a passion for the teaching of his word, which is a whole nother story because I never thought I could do this. Never did this. I mean, high school, my high school counselor, we sat down and I came up with two principles, like never speak in public, never lead anything. And they're like, Jim, dude, you know yourself. Like, that is so cool. It's like, that's my life. That's my whole goal of my life. <laughs> and so God begins calling and it's like, no, I can't do that. But I loved it. I loved, I loved, I loved watching it. I loved I loved a message. I loved to, to, to see how it processed. I loved, I loved that. And I loved the thought of a healthy church. I mean, you could, I could take Ephesians 4 any day and read Ephesians 4 where he says that he's given leaders to equip the saints and edify them and build them up. And I'm just going to tell you, my heart beats. There's just like, oh, like I want that. Like that, that's that right there. God began showing me that that was my passion. Like I had a passion for this. And it's like, Really? That's crazy. I mean, that's, that's wild. But I found it to be true. And then he began letting me teach and eventually be a pastor. And I can tell you to this day, it terrifies me. It scares me because it should. But there's nothing else I'd rather do. I, I find it to be my joy. I find it to be passion. I find it, I can tell you, I do this not just because I have to. I love doing what I do. I, I love that. And I love that God connected it that way. I, I love that he did that. And it was one of those things that just blew my mind in so many ways to say, hey, that's exactly what he would do. Now, that's my past, but let me very quickly just bring you up to my present. So this has become such a big part of my life that it kind of works out this way. You may not be like me, but I, I still struggle with these things. I'm still wanting everything that God has for my life. I still want to figure out what that looks like, and so thoughts will come into my head comes in my head a lot of different ways. Sometimes I'm just thinking about it. Sometimes I read a book. Sometimes I hear a sermon that somebody says and, 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 and just approaches me with something that I'm not doing or a way that I'm not doing ministry. Um, sometimes it happens because I get one of those little e emails that you maybe some of you get, you know, when somebody just tells me all that I'm doing wrong and how I could do it better and, uh, you know, how I could be a better pastor if I just do it more the way they would like me to do it. Um, it happens. I mean, I understand. Hey, it just, it does. Um, sometimes it happens because I meet incredibly godly men. So there's a bunch of pastors in this room who I have been able to fellowship with over this, uh, you know, last couple years on Zoom, and their passions move me. And, and we get together, we have a, a Zoom call that we do uh, once a week, and I'm just going to be honest, sometimes I end those Zoom calls, and it's like, man, these guys have such passion, and it's like, and, and, and there's a piece of me that then can take some of those things and go, God, do you want me to be more like that? Do you want me to do what they're doing? You know, do, do you have that? Now, again, I'm just trying to be honest with my heart and how this works, and I'm not sure it's going to land in anybody else's in that way, but it can go a couple of ways. In those moments when I've read the book, heard the sermon, had somebody criticize me, or I've compared myself to somebody else, it can lead to condemnation, first of all, where I'm like, man, that's just broken. I'm just broken. That's not working for me. Or I can begin to think, well, maybe I'm just going to do that too. I'm going to do what they do, you know, fake it till you make it, you know, kind of thing. You know, just, hey, I'm just going to just do the same thing. It's not where my heart is, but, man, I want to be like them. And there's this moment where that can happen. And, and, and God has been really good to me that I've been able to hopefully get to the place that I stop before I go down those roads. Instead, I come to what I'm trying to tell you right now. I, I, I get to go before God and say, God, if that's what you have for me, give me a heart for it. If that's what you want for me to do, I don't want to do it just because everybody else is doing it. I don't want to do it just because somebody else thinks I should do it. God, if this is what you're doing, if this is what you have for my life, I know that you're not going to try to conform me from the outside. You're not going to press me into a mold. Man, change me from the inside out. And there's probably no way for me to tell you uh, how life-giving that is. But I want to tell you it's life-giving. Because in that space, there's peace. I don't know where you are. I, I, again, I can't speak into your life. I'm just going to tell you where I am. I'll do anything God wants me to do. I'll do anything he wants me to do, but I want him to lead me to do it. And, and I'm not afraid of that. And, and I, I'll have those conversations like, God, if that's what you have me to do, give me the desire to do it. You change me from the inside. Like, you give me that passion, I'm in. I'll do it. Uh, whatever that is. I mean, I, can, I, I think I can honestly say that. I'm not afraid of his will. I'm afraid of missing it. But I am also aware how easy it is to try to be something you're not. That for some of us, we, we, we try to imitate somebody else or try to press ourselves into some other mold and, and to come back to this place of saying, God, I want it to happen in a, in a way that I'd be changed from the inside out. I want you to transform me 
I want you to give me those desires. And so that place draws me to that. So I told you I'd give you three things in the book of Nehemiah. I told you providence, I told you passion. The last one is prayer, which is kind of where I just landed it. We won't go through and read all of it uh, for time's sake, but I just want you to see that's exactly what he does. So we began reading it back up there um, in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. He says, so it was when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And so he was. The rest of the chapter is his prayer. If you're unfamiliar with it, hey, before you go to bed tonight, go and read that. Read through the whole prayer. It's an incredibly good prayer. But let me just give you this. It's a prayer that he begins to pray. And as we put the timetable together from the beginning of the chapter of chapter 1 to the beginning of the chapter in chapter 2, it's a prayer that he starts praying for four months. Uh, it's a prayer that he is just crying out to God day after day, day after day. God, is, is this what you have? Is this what, is this what you want to do? Would you open up a door for this? And I love that. It is the place where discovering God's will is both the most exciting but also the most safe. Because again, one of those dangerous things that can happen for me and for you is sometimes, again, we can get secondhand passion. We read a book, we hear a sermon, and we can be motivated. Hey, like, that's what I'm going to do too. I'm going to go do that same thing. And then finding yourself out there that it's not, one of the best places to do is just, is just to begin talking to God about it. Hey, God, is this what you want? Is this how you made me? Is this what you want for me to do? Show me how to do that. Open up a door because I'll, go, I'll walk through it if you open it up. And if this is what you have for me, and that's a powerful space. It's a space where I continue to, to talk to God about pretty much every day. I like to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us just to simply pray, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I, and I like to talk to him about that. And I talk to him about that. And I very often uh, bring before him Philippians 2. God, you said, God, you said you would work inside of me to will and do for your good pleasure. God, I want that. Here's my heart. <laughs> like, like, you said you're the potter. You said I'm the clay. God, do that. Like, shape me, make me, make me what you want me to be, and I'm in. Like, let's go. Let's, let's do what that is, however that works, and that's where it becomes so exciting. Now, I say all of that, and your story might be different, but I recognize probably from different directions, many of you have found that same thing. You're serving Jesus in this church. You're serving Jesus in your church, and you found your passion. You, you found your place where sometimes you almost want to pinch yourself. It's like, they let me do this. This is like really cool. Like I get to do what I love to do. It's, way, it's wild just that, that, that that's what God would do in my life. And I want to tell you, it's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a place where he would open it up to you, that he would work in you to will and to do, that he would transform you so that you would prove that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Don't move from it. Because in your flesh you would move from it, and Satan would love to move you from it. If he could do it, he would move you from what God has for your life where you would be unfruitful. Don't do it. But maybe you're here tonight and you're still searching. And you're like, Jim, I don't know. I I, sometimes I feel like I am just a bystander. Like maybe God's point for my life is that I just get to sit on the sidelines and watch other people serve. Nope, I can guarantee it. God has, has made you for a purpose. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared ahead of you that all you have to do is walk in them. And I want to invite you to that. I want to invite you into that space where you would say, God, I want that. Like here's my heart. Like here's me. Like you, if, if you'll do that, if you'll work inside of me so that when I think about this, that you would change me, that you would cause me, that you'd cause me to, to do that, would I be a workmanship created in Christ for good works, that you would do it again, as it said in Philippians 2.13, that God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I just want to tell you, that's an exciting venture. I mean, it's an exciting venture that if that's not where you are, I'm inviting you to pursue it. And to find out God has a, has a plan for you. And it's, it's one that, that, that it, your life would engage in those things. And you would find yourself thinking, there's joy here. There's satisfaction. There's fulfillment. There's what Jesus said. This is my food to do that which God has given me to do. And I'm inviting you to that. So 
You can close your Bibles, notebooks, whatever it is you got open. I'm going to take a moment and ask for it. Just ask that God would do that in you and he would do that in me. And that even tonight, he would be directing our lives to do those good works that he has promised to do in us. So let's pray. God, your ways are amazing. Honestly, they are. I look at your amazing grace and I know this, it's grace. It's by grace we're saved. None of us have earned this. We didn't deserve it. But Jesus, you you paid the whole price. And you brought us out of death. You brought us out of sin. You brought us out of emptiness. And in so many ways, that would be enough just to be saved. But then you do this amazing thing that doesn't stop there, that you tell us not only that, not only are we now saved, now we're your workmanship created in Christ for good works, which you have prepared ahead of time for us to walk in. And I just want to come before you right now, Father, and say, I believe you. I believe you're doing this. Here I am. Here's our hearts tonight. Uh, For each person that's here, here we are. God, would you give us a desire to do those things you want us to do? Would you shape us from the inside out? Would you lead us to those things that you have for us to be about by the desires that you would place into us? I love that you do that, that it's not fake, it's not phony, it's not hypocritical, it's not plastic. It's this incredible joy that you would do inside of us. God, because you said you're doing that, I just ask for it. Mold us and make us, shape us for the good works that you have for us. And then by your providence, bring them face to face with us and help us to step into them. Help us to step into those things that you would have us to do, that we'd be about your good work. You promised us that you'd do that. You'd make us for that. So God, here we are. Here we are now. Could you be that one that just is working inside of us to will and to do for your good pleasure? We ask for it now. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.